Chapter 12 Peter's first battle While the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, miles away the beavers and the children were walking on hour after hour in the wet cement a delicious dream. Long ago they had left the coach behind them, and by now they had even stopped saying to one another, Look, there is a kingfisher, or... I say, bluebills are, what was that lovely smell, or just listen to the trust. They walk on in silence, stringing it all in passing through patches of warm sunlight into cool green tickets and out again into white mossy glades where tall elms rise at the leafy roof far overhead and then into dense masses of flowering corn and among how torn pieces where the sweet smell was almost overpowering. They had been just a surprise as Edmund when they saw the winter vanishing and the whole world passing in a few hours or so from January to May. They had not even now for certain as the witch did that this was what would happen when Aslan came to Narnia. But they all knew that it was her spell which had produced the endless winter and three four day all knew when this magic swearing began that something had gone wrong and badly wrong with the witch schemes and after the trial after the trial had been going on for some time they are released the witch would no longer be able to use her sledge after that they did not hurry so much and they allowed themselves more rest, more rest and longer one. They were pretty tired by now, of course, but not what I would call bitterly tired, only slow and feeling very dreamy and quiet inside as one does when one is coming to the end of a long day in the open. Susan had a slight blister when hill. They had left the coast of the big river some time ago, for one had to turn a little to the right, that meant a little to the south, to reach the place of the stone table. Even if this had not been their way, they could not have kept to the river valley once the tow began. For with all that melting snow, the river was soon in flood, a wonderful roaring, thundering yellow flood, and their bed would have been underwater. And now the sun got low and the light got redder, and the shadows got longer and the flowers began to think about closing. Not long now, said Mr. Beaver. They began leading them uphill across some very deep, springy moss. It felt nice under their tired feet, in a place where only tall trees grew, very wide apart, the climb coming at the end of the long day met them all pen and blow, and just as Lucy was wondering whether she could really get to the top without another long rest, suddenly they were at the top, and this is what they saw. They were on a green open space from which you could look down on the forest spreading as far as one could see in every direction except right ahead there far to the east 
was something twinkly and moving. By gum, whispered Peter to Susan. The sea in the very middle of this open hilltop was the stone table. It was a great cream slab of grey stone support on four upright stones. It looked very old and it was cut all over with stranger lines and figures that might be the letters of an Okinaw language. They gave you a serious feeling when you look at them. The next things they saw was a pavilion pictures on one side of the open place, a wonderful pavilion it was, and especially now, when the light of the setting sun fell upon it with sides on of what looked like yellow silk and cord of crimson and tan patch of ivory, and hike above it on a pole a banner which bore a red rampant lion fluttering and the breeze which was blowing in their face from the far off sea while they were looking at this they heard a sound of music on their right and turning in that direction they saw what they had come to see Aslan stood in the center of a crowd of creatures who had grouped themselves around him in the shape of a half moon. There were three women, three and well women, Drit and Nage, as they used to be called in our world, who had stringed instruments. It was they who had made the music. There were four great centaurs. The horse part of them was like you English from house, and the man part was like stern but beautiful giants. There was also a unicorn and a bull with the head of a man, and a pelican, and an eagle, and a great dog. And next to Aslan stood two leopard of whom one carried his crown and the others his standard. But as for Aslan himself, the beavers and the children did know, didn't know what to do or say when they say him. And they saw him. People who have not been in Narnia sometimes think that a thing cannot be good and trivial at the time at the same time if the children had ever talked so they were cured of it now for when they tired to look at Aslan's face they just caught a glimpse of the golden man and the great royal solemn overwhelming eyes and then they found they couldn't look at him and went all trembly. Gone, whispered Mr. Beaver. No, whispered Peter. You first. No sons of Adam before animals, whispered Mr. Beaver back again. Susan, whispered Peter. What about you, ladies first? No. You are the eldest, whispered Susan, and of course the longer they went on doing this the more awkward they felt. Then at last Peter realized that is that is was up to him. He drew his sword and raised hand it to the salute and hastily saying to the others, Come on. Pull yourself together, he, adv- he advanced to the lion and said, We have come, Aslan. Welcome, Peter, son of Adam, said Aslan. Welcome, Susan and Lucy, doctors of Eve. Welcome, he beavers and see beaver. His voice 
was deep and rich, and somehow took the fidgets out of them. They now felt glad and quiet, and it did not seem a card to them to stand and say nothing. But where is the fort? asked Alslan. He has started to betray them and joined the white witch or Aslan's before and then something made Peter say. That was partly my fault, Aslan. I was angry with him and I think that helped him to grow wrong. And Aslan said nothing either to accuse Peter or to blame him but merely stood looking at him with his great unhugging eyes and it seemed to all of them that there was nothing to be said. Please, Aslan, said Lucy, can anything be done to save Edmund? All shall be done, said Aslan, but it may be harder than you think. And then he was silenced again for some time up to the moment Lucy had been thinking how royal and strong and peaceful his face looked. Now it suddenly came into her head that he looked sad as well, but next minute that expression was quite gone. The lion shook his men and clapped his paws together. Tribble's paws told Lucy. If he didn't know how to velvet them and said, Meanwhile, let the first be prepared, ladies, take this daughter of Evie to the pavilion and minister to them. When the girls had gone, Aslan laid his paw and thought it was velvet, it was very heavy on Peter's shoulder and said, Come, son of Adam, I will show you a far off sight of the castle where you are to be king. And Peter, with his sword still drawn in his hand, went with the lion to the eastern edge of the hilltop. There a beautiful sight met their eyes. The sun was setting behind their back. That meant that the whole country below them lay in the evening like forests and hills and valleys and Winding away like a silver snake, the lower part of the great rivers, and beyond all these miles away was the sea, and beyond the sea the sky, full of clouds which were just turning rose color with the reflection of the sunset. But just where the land of Narnia met the sea, in fact, at the mouth of the great river, there was something on a little hill shining. It was shining because it was a castle, and of course, the sunlight was reflected from all the windows, which looked towards Peter and sunset. But to Peter, it looked like a great star resting on the scissor. That, oh man said Aslan, is care powerful of the four thrones in a one of which you must sit as king. I saw it to you because you are the firstborn and you will be king over all the rest. And once more Peter said nothing, for at the moment a strange noise woke the silence suddenly. It was like a bugle but richer. It is your sister horn, said Aslan to Peter in a low voice, so low as to be almost a purr. If it's not disrespectful to think of a lion purring. For a moment, Peter did not understand. Then when he saw all the other creatures start forward and heard Aslan say, with a wave of his paw, beg, let the prince win his purse. He did understand and set off running as hard 
as he called to the pavilion, and there he saw a dreadful sight. The knights and riot were scattering in every direction. Lucy was running towards. Lucy was running towards him as fast as her short leg would carry her, and her face was as white as paper. Then he saw Susan make a dash for a tree and swing herself up, followed by a hawk, Gravis. At first, Peter thought it was a bear. Then he saw that it looked like an assassin. Thought it was far too big to be a dog. Then he realized that it was a wolf. A wolf standing on his hind legs, with its front paws again the tree trunk, snapping, snapping and snarling all the hair on its back. Stood up on end. Susan had not been able to get high her. Then the second big branch, one of her legs, hung down so that her foot was only an inch or two above the snapping teeth. Before Peter wondered why she did not get high her, or at least take a better grip. Then he realized. That she was just going to find, and that if she fainted, she would fall off. Peter didn't feel very brave. Either he felt he was going to be sick, but that made no difference to what he had to do. He rushed straight up to the. Monster and aimed a slice of his sword at his side. That stroke never reacted. The wolf, quick as lightning, is turned round, its eyes flaming, and its mouth wide open in a bow, in a howl of anger. If it had not been so angry that it simply had to howl, it would have got him by the throat one. At once, at this was talk all this happened too quickly for Peter to think out. All he had just time to duck down and pull his sword as hard as he could between the brute privilege into the heart. The came a true a horrible, confused moment like something in a nightmare. He was tugging and pulling the wolf. Seemed neither alive nor dead, and its bird did knock again. His forefeet and everything was blood and heat and hair. A moment later, I found that the monster lay dead, and he had drawn his sword out of it. Was straightening his back and rubbing the sweat of his face, and out of his house, he felt tired all over. Then, after a bit, Susan came down the tree. She and Peter felt pretty shaky when they met, and I won't say there was not kissing and crying on both sides. But in Narnia, no one thinks any the worse of you for that. Quick, quick! Shouted the voice of Aslan. Centaur's eagle. I see another wolf in the thicket. There, behind you. He has just turned. Away, after him, all of you. He will be going to his mistress. Now is your chance to find the witch and rescue the fourth son of Adam. And instantly, with thunder of hoofs and beating of wings, a dozen or so of the sweetest creatures disappear into the gathering darkness. Peter, still out of breath, turned and saw Aslan close at hand. You have forgot to clean your sword," said Aslan. It was true. Peter blushed when he looked at the bright blade. Saw it all smeared with the wolf hair and blood. He stooped down, wiped it quite clean on grass, and then wiped it quite dry on coat. Had it to come, and Neil, son of Adam, said Aslan. And when Peter had done so, he threw. 
him with the flat of the bed and said, Rise up, Sir Peter, Wolf Ben, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. Now we must get back to Edmund. When he had been met to walk far further than he had ever now that anybody could walk, the witch at last halt in a dark valley, all overshadowed with fair trees and yellow trees. Edmund simply sank down and lay on his face, doing nothing at all and not even caring. What was going to happen next, Prophet? They would let him lie still. He was too tired even to notice how hungry and thirsty he was. The witch and the dwarf were talking close beside him in low tones. No, said the dwarf, it is no use now, O queen. They must have reached the stone table by now. Perhaps the wolf will smell you out the brings you news said the witch it cannot be good news if he does said the dwarf four thrones in care powerful said the witch how if only three were filled that will not fulfill the prochely what difference will that make now that he is here said the dwarf he did not dare even now to mention the name of aslan to his mistress, he may not stay long, and then we would fall you upon the tree a chair. Yet it might be better, said the dwarf, to keep this one. Here he kicked Edmund for beginning with.